Just think for a moment and ask yourself, how would this government or any government benefit from destroying an industry which has contributed so much to the overall development of our country? Why would any government want to increase unemployment and loss of export revenue? While it may be true that no government will knowingly destroy the livelihood of its citizens, a failure to act, a miscalculated intervention, and reluctance to accept blame and make amends will eventually lead to total collapse. Yesterday's change in global climate, loss of market, not to mention spectacular strikes, led to the demise of King Sugar. But is history being repeated with the rise and fall of green gold? Green bananas were first exported from St. Lucia in 1911 in insignificant amounts. By 1924, the local Swift Banana Cooperation secured a market in Canada and New York. Exports increased from 4,000 bunches in 1924, worth a mere £256 at the time, to over 46,000 bunches just two years later. But by 1927, with a tip disease destroyed St. Lucia's banana crop, and most of the fields were recultivated with sugarcane. A second attempt was made in 1934 when the Canadian Banana Company committed to buy all the gourmet shells St. Lucia could produce at 50 cents a bunch. This was indeed the genesis of St. Lucia's Banana Association and extensive cultivation commenced. The association provided peasant farmers with healthy plants and offered technical assistance to ensure a top quality crop. Revenue from banana production enticed new farmers Night, large tracts of rainforest were being cleared for cultivation. By 1935, 830 acres were under bananas, a 200% increase over 1934. By 1936, banana was competing with cocoa and had king sugar dead in its sights. By 1938, the industry employed over 1,100 persons and production was up to 100,000 bunches. The influx of new farmers and an abundance of virgin soil led to the dangerous practice of slash and burn. Such practice was condemned by the experts who the budding farmers ignored in search of green gold. But their actions would plunge the nation into Black Monday. On November 21st and 22nd, 1938, an avalanche of soft yellow clay swept away a school and the homes of 700 residents of L'Abbaye and Ravin Poisson. When the mud stopped, the death toll stood at 101. This disaster was etched in our annals of history as the Ravin Poisson disaster. By 1948, unable to expand its volume of sugar in a market where prices were steadily dropping, the future of St. Lucia's economy was bleaker than ever. We can see the yellow smoke of the gunfire above the battleships. While World War II had many economies in shambles, the revolution from Massa days of sugarcane cultivation was on its last leg. John Compton, in his most rebunctious years, led the onslaught on King Sugar. Between 1954 and 58, banana production island-wide tripled. The Geese Tide and Geese Crest docked weekly, allowing women to carry over 21 tons of green bananas aboard. Abel Giraro is 88 years old. His career as an agriculturist started off as an estate overseer when sugar was king. As St. Lucia transitioned from Sugar Manufacturers Limited to the production of bananas, he was responsible for the expansion of production under Geest Industries Limited. Mr. John Van Geest had been buying bananas from Dominique. 
and you wanted to encourage the Windward Islands to start banana production. So he came to St. Lucia and persuaded the company to start planting bananas. I was then sent to Martinique to learn what I could about bananas because they had been eating bananas for, for a long time, supplying the French market. Mm -hmm. So I went there and I learned about banana production and all that and we were able to purchase plants from them. Come to St. Lucia and started the banana planting business. Sugar revenue declined with the Denry Estates going out of business in 1958. By 1959, the Rosso and Cul-de-Sac Estates bowed out, leaving thousands of St. Lucian workers on the breadline. We had established a good banana industry when geese came out and um, offered to buy the company which was called Shoe Manufacturers then and offered to buy the company and since the company was doing so badly um, geese bought over the entire two estates and as soon as he bought them he closed down the factories completely and went to the bananas in a big way and that's how we really started with bananas. In 1963, St. Lucia ceased production of sugar altogether, exactly two years after the crop was first introduced. John Van Geest ensured that peasant farmers would have sufficient support to expand banana cultivation. Soon after we started, we had many, besides the estate, that was beginning to plant bananas. We had hillside farmers. The estate was the cul-de-sac flat. Then we had hillside farmers whom we encouraged to go into bananas. And so they started. We got in plants from Martin and we planted for ourselves and we supplied to the, to the farmers. And then at that time too, the Banana Growers Association was formed. In 1956, banana export revenues represented 37% of total revenue. However, with the advent of geese, revenue soared to 80% by 1962. The first geese boat came down called the Geese Dam, a small banana boat, and began buying, they were already buying the Dominica bananas, and they started buying ours. And then we expanded until the whole of the Colossal Valley and the Rosso Valley went to the bananas. First of all, in those days you had to carry it to uh, the shed that was owned by the estate owner. And they would pay you by the bunch to bring it. Uh, you would travel sometimes, as like I say, up to six miles from inside to bring it down, you know, inland or far from the roadside to bring it to the shed and they would pay you by the bunch. In those days it wasn't dollars and cents either, it was pounds, shillings and pence. Every once in a while, a company will appear on the scene with a fresh perspective, a burst of adrenaline, and a passion for excellence. Its humble beginnings are steeped in social transformation. Last to enter the arena, it changes the status quo and the game will never be the same again. The independent film company appeared on the scene when the commercial sector needed it most. Its metamorphosis blossomed with the production of the most creative television commercials in St. Lucia, and they do it all absolutely free. From marketing concepts, surveys and research, to professionally produced ads for social media and television, and the most engaging documentaries in the English-speaking Caribbean. With heavy investments in technology and a focus on building the technical and service capacity of its nimble team, it prides itself on being the little company that could.
the Independent Film Company Incorporated, changing yesterday's game, rewriting today's roles, and charting the way for multimedia production here, now, and beyond. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing, from the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products, the dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows doors and all glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. They're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454-6538. I watched him on the bed, knowing a man who has worked his entire life, can't afford the cost of his surgery or medication. Mom and I must sell barbecue tickets to help save his life. For less than $4 a day, the cost of a packet of gum, my dad could have been airlifted to get treatment. Some adults can be so insensitive with their lack of foresight. Now, mom and I either have to watch him wither away or sell a whole lot more barbecue. Why? because one person didn't care enough to plan. GTM Medical Insurance. Less than $4 a day for the greatest peace of mind anyone could ask for. Call us today, First banana tree, I can still remember planting it, and it was a grow shell. right in the corner of my my grandma's house. And in those days, we we didn't have fertilizer, but we had to use the natural manual. Or during that time, we used to ship bananas in wrappers and nylon, and that thing. Um, from then, we came into the the processing and boxing of bananas, which we used to use, we used to call fill pack bananas. Over 47,000 tons of bananas were exported in 1979. But by 1980, a combination of Hurricane Allen and a dysfunctional SLP government led to a drop in production levels to 29,000 tons, the lowest figure in 20 years. We were called the white man's company and all members of the staff have always had a senior one. We are 
we are deemed to be puppets of, of geese, you know. And, uh, and they made capital of it. They tried, they tried many times to, to get the growers to go on strike, but they would not because their livelihood was in the banana business. By May 1982, John Compton's government was back in control of the national ship with a 14 to 3 mandate. A tripod of development was established with agriculture, manufacturing and tourism being the pillars of the economy. Early 80s, farming banana cultivation became a lot easier because farm road began to open, open up. At that time, John, uh, former Prime Minister John Compton insisted, you know, on opening farm roads around for, to make it a lot accessible to the farmers and easy to cultivate bananas. And it was around this time, <laughs> land started opening up and government really started having problems because, you know, there were roads around, make it very, very easy for individuals to farm and cultivate bananas. But how would it have created problems for government? Well, the thing is, you know, the trade became a little lucrative. And at the time, at the time, you know, most people were looking to tap in to what was then, bananas. I don't know if you are aware that it was called at that time green gold, and everybody wanted to be part and parcel of it. Economically, the bananas were contributing to the uh, well-being of the, the, of the country. There was a social dislocation, which was a transition from where we were from more or less feudal times, you know, because you know it was good. You had you had 75% uh, of the uh, of the country being illiterate, you know, as before I came and so on. So a lot of people had not come to terms with that development. The banana growers in the country was what I called self-maintained slaves. While the banana industry was doing very well in the country. Everybody that was involved in working for the banana growers was making much, much, much more than the farmer themselves was making. And also, uh, they looked down upon the very same farmer they needed to, to, to actually plant the bananas so they could eat. But somehow or the other, they saw themselves as being better. In 1986, Banana production exceeded 112,000 tons. Growers were enjoying their best returns in the industry's history. It was the year when banana truly deserved its title, Green Gold. SLBG grossed something like $2.5 million a week. Okay? That's almost 100 plus million. They had about 600 employees. The only organization that came near SLVGA uh, was an organization perhaps Lucille and Cable and Wireless at that time because it was a monopoly. Okay. But neither of them had the gross 40 million for the year. Okay? So by a long shot, SLVGA was the biggest organization. At one time, we had bananas planted almost everywhere in the Lucia, the flats, the hills, and everywhere else. And we, we, we thought that was not the best thing, that you needed to um, do bananas where it's best suited for banana production, but at the same time, you need to do it in a manner that is um, profitable to the farmers. And we, we, we realized over the years that whereas we had volume coming out of the country, the productivity level was very low. In 1985, with a booming agricultural sector, there were still several social ills plaguing for Helen. Yes, we have a problem to control we great population. What about the children? They need shelter and education. The school that the government provides. 
At 33 births per 1,000 persons, St. Lucia had one of the highest birth rates in the Western Hemisphere. The Green Gold Rush again contributed to indiscriminate agricultural practices which encouraged soil erosion that led to damaged watersheds and was also blamed for a 10-acre landslide in forest air. But this was minuscule compared to the magnitude of problems which lay ahead for dear Lucia. In 1987, the British government wrote to this country and the windward about bananas saying put your house in order because by 1992-93 we're going to be forming with the, the European Union would be formed and there will no, no longer be a British government support and because of that we're giving you five years to put your business in order so when the free market comes about in Europe you will not be at a lesser advantage than what you are. Uh, there was very little I think that we could have done to, to, to kind of uh, stall that. I, I think what we should have been doing was preparing ourselves for the eventual liberalization of the market. And that's really to get more efficient, increase productivity and be more competitive because it calls for comp you need to compete. Nobody is going to shelter you anymore. The trade dispute involving bananas has been one of the longest running and perhaps the most difficult in the history of the WTO. And it's a dispute where the European Union has been squarely and unequivocally in the wrong. Its policy has been to favour producers in some former colonies at the expense of the principles of free trade, which are of course enshrined notionally in the Treaty of Rome. And this policy has been bad for everyone. It's been bad for consumers in Europe who have had to pay much higher prices. It's been bad for exporters. It's been bad for international harmony and the Comity of Nations. And it's been bad for the people it was notionally designed to protect. It was clear to us that the British the British and the Europeans were telling us, look, preferential treatment is over. You are going to be on the market on your own. And, uh, <laughs> well, John Compton insisted, insisted on telling us, you know, that that is not so. He's certain that the European, uh, Europeans and the British will continue to give us assistance and protection on the market whereas that was not so. Every once in a while, a company will appear on the scene with a fresh perspective, a burst of adrenaline, and a passion for excellence. Its humble beginnings are steeped in social transformation. Last to enter the arena, it changes the status quo, and the game will never be the same again. The independent film company appeared on the scene when the commercial sector needed it most. Its metamorphosis blossomed with the production of the most creative television commercials in St. Lucia, and they do it all absolutely free. From marketing concepts, surveys and research, to professionally produced ads for social media and television, and the most engaging documentaries in the English-speaking Caribbean. With heavy investments in technology, and a focus on building the technical and service capacity of its nimble team, it prides itself on being the little company that could. The Independent Film Company Incorporated, changing yesterday's game, rewriting today's roles, and charting the way for multimedia production here, now and beyond.
Hey, stop it. That's what I'm here for. For over 138 years, we've had your back. From home contents to medical, auto to business continuity. GTM Insurance. Sound, solid, and reliable. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing, from the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products, the dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows, doors and all-glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. They're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454 6538. As feared, on the 1st of January 1993, the European single market came into effect. Banana exports from St. Lucia became subjected to a regime of quotas and tariffs under the Lomé Convention. In no time, the European market became flooded with bananas and prices collapsed. Preferential trading arrangements with Mother England would soon come to a scratching halt. This caused sleepless nights for FAR owners. Compton's government made streamlining the industry a matter of urgency. But had that information been disseminated to Joe Farmer in a timely and effective manner? Every year from 87 all the way to 92, the government just giving us song and dance. Yeah, the, we, they give us some more time. They, they, we, they will take care of us even though what that happened. They gave you all kinds of story. In 1992, when everybody in the world knew that the European Union would have been completed by 1993, the farmers had the money, Christmas coming, but they know things are going to get hard next year and they wouldn't spend the money. The Prime Minister of the day went to England and upon returning, he raised his hand in there and said, Be feel free to spend my people because we have been saved by the British government and they said they are going to support us up until the end. We have no deadline anymore, which was a damn lie. I mean, it, it eventually came down to what we highlighted, you know, that was going to take place. And that is we would not have any more preferential treatment on the market. Banana can be a very sensitive matter here and there's some things people choose to tell the public and others they choose not to tell the public. But I, I believe that um, generally whether it was UWP or Labour, I don't think the idea of the government had come out openly and, and really pumped it into the minds of the people that this thing is going to be over and that you need to get ready. I think they made some, some comments, people who said, well, listen, it's good. you need to get ready, but there was not an aggressive approach, if you want me to put it that way, an aggressive approach to indoctrinate into the minds of people. You need to change your ways. Um, things are not going to be business as usual. This announcement saw the mass exodus of many farmers, including the patron saint himself. The Monrepo farming community was now left without a voice. Realizing I wouldn't come back, 
they came to me. I just, one day I was on my farm, finished feeding my animal, working, and I see about 10 to 12 pickup trucks came, load with banana plants and a gang of people. And they just came and started cutlassing an area in my farm and they planted about 5,000 mats of bananas. With the full support of Monrepo farmers, Pat was once again in the forefront of the struggle. But the battle had just begun. I was not the president of the Banana Salvation Committee and never has been. I never been president of the Banana Salvation Committee. But the meeting that actually formed the Salvation Committee was the week prior to that. And at that time, Abel Wilson called that meeting and farmers came there. And when we formed that thing, they say, well, how are we going to call it? So he said, we'll call it Banana Salvation Committee, and that's how it gets its name. And he became the first president, and I was only the secretary. I was not even a, 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 a vice president. But I guess, again, I am the fool that always runs his mouth, who thinks he gets away with anything. So I could not see the injustice. So I was the one who always come forward and open my mouth. What was the mandate of the Salvation Committee? Salvation Committee really did not have a mandate, you know. It started as a, a pressure group, as a pressure group. We just wanted to highlight, you know, certain things. And at that time, we told former Prime Minister, you know, John Compton, that we cannot assist him in trying to deceive us, deceive us in thinking, you know, that the European Union will continue to give us assistance, assistance and protection. While the government pursued its agenda of restructuring the banana industry in the middle of 1993, farmers in Monrepo, backed by the Banana Salvation Committee, decided to flex their muscles. They announced strikes demanding a greater share in the money earned by geese, a minimum price for their fruit, and the end to mismanagement practices at the SLBGA. But even after government announced a five-point plan of action, farmers would not back down. The, the aim was not to destroy the banana industry, the aim was to make a point. And the point was that we wanted the authorities to understand bananas is still the livelihood of most farmers around the place. And farmers depended on that, and farmers depended on them to tell them what the real truth is about the banana industry. I was not out there during this, this whole thing. I was not in charge. Uh, Joseph, you were telling me in 2012 you were not in charge of the strikes of 93? No, no. Strike of 93, when the farmers got killed, I was not in charge. I was, was the charge? secretary. Who was in charge? Nobody was in charge. Nobody was in charge of the strike of 93? The strike that the two farmers got killed, nobody was in charge. Nobody. Right? Now, this may be something that people don't want to believe, but nobody was in charge. The farmers insisted on personal guarantees from Prime Minister John Compton, who had been off island at the time. Compton pleaded with them from the United States, but farmers had had enough. I drove my car and I could only reach as far as Grand Rivier. And the only reason why I reached that far is because the people let me through. But after Grand Rivier, there was no way I could go because there was a 40-foot container across the road. So, I walked from Grand Rivier all the way to La Bay. Uh, before I reached La Bay, when we came over the Bad Lil walking and walked down the Bad Lil, when we reached Ravin Poisson, just after you crossed the bridge, we made a contingent of SSU with their rifles and their riot gears and when they saw us coming, they started firing shots. So I tried, when I looked for my partners, there was nowhere beside me. They was gone. Uh, so again, me being the fool, I didn't dock, I didn't do anything, I just insist I have to talk to whoever is in charge. It happened to be that Brian Bernard at the time, I think he was 
assistant commissioner or something or the other, but he was in charge of that group. And he told him he's not interested. They're talking to nobody, everybody back up the hill. They're pushing people up the hill. So uh, I said, no, because I have to talk to him. If I don't talk to him and I can't get to Castries, he might as well kill me now because a lot of people are going to die. Life is a series of triumphs and trials. The circle of life has all the usual certainties and, of course, the unpredictable. Just one can affect you and your loved ones. Sadly, many fail to prepare for the unforeseen. Thankfully, we've been here for over 138 years, helping you plan and recover. We offer peace of mind at that critical moment. GTM Insurance, sound, solid, and reliable. Call us today at 458-6300 or log on to gtminsurance.net. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing, from the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products, the dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows, doors and all glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. They're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454-6538. I watched him on the bed, knowing a man who has worked his entire life can't afford the cost of his surgery or medication. Mom and I must sell barbecue tickets to help save his life. For less than $4 a day, the cost of a packet of gum, my dad could have been airlifted to get treatment. Some adults can be so insensitive with their lack of foresight. Now, Mom and I either have to watch him wither away or sell a whole lot more barbecue. Why? Because one person didn't care enough to plan. GTM Medical Insurance. Less than $4 a day for the greatest peace of mind anyone could ask for. Call us today, 458-6300. Every once in a while, a company will appear on the scene with a fresh perspective, a burst of adrenaline, and a passion for excellence. Its humble beginnings are steeped in social transformation. Last to enter the arena, it changes the status quo, and the game will never be the same again. The independent film company appeared on the scene when the commercial sector needed it most. Its metamorphosis blossomed with the production of the most creative television commercials in St. Lucia, and they do it all absolutely free. 
from marketing concepts, surveys and research to professionally produce ads for social media and television and the most engaging documentaries in the English-speaking Caribbean. With heavy investments in technology and a focus on building the technical and service capacity of its nimble team, it prides itself on being the little company that could. The Independent Film Company Incorporated, changing yesterday's game, rewriting today's roles and charting the way for multimedia production here, now and beyond. Compton returned to St. Lucia only to taste firsthand the full wrath of irate farmers when a stone throwing brigade near Richford Denry attacked his car, barely allowing him to escape physical injury. Compton decided that enough was enough and ordered the police to bring the situation under control by any means necessary. On Thursday, 7th October 1993, police moved in with tractors and automatic weapons and a confrontation ensued in the Mabuya Valley. When the hail of bullets stopped, Julius and Randy Joseph lay dead. Two people got killed. Two people got killed and their representatives or the people they have chose to spoke on their behalf have gone out and make a deal on their behalf that is not any better than what they got killed for. Were they farmers? Of course they was farmers. I know where the police stayed and shoot these two guys. When you come in into Grand Rivier, you pass the flat past which one, you go through the banana field. You swing the corner where the bridge is kind of lopsided there. They stayed in that corner there and they opened fire with live ammunition. They, 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 they'll tell you all kinds of things because some of the tape is showing you people throwing stones at police and so on. True, that happened. But they didn't throw bullets. No police didn't get killed. And the distance they stayed to shoot those people and the amount of bullet that was sprayed into that hillside at Mont Panache, there's no way anybody can justify it. But at the end of the day, it was okay because John Campton said, clear the road at any cost. Right? And that's what they did at the cost of Randy and Julius' life. A lot of people, people don't know. There was another 19 to 20 people that had bullets in their back, bullets in their side. Within hours of the shooting, mediation by the Chamber of Commerce ended the strike and the farmers were given a price increase. The next day, in a nationwide address, Compton flagged and dissolved the SLVGA board. Not surprising, the St. Lucia Labour Party condemned the government's handling of the crisis. By February 1994, the Banana Salvation Committee organized yet another strike protesting government's plans to put the debt-ridden SLBGA into receivership. A number of boxing plants were burned. Other non-BSC farmers requested police protection to be able to harvest their fruit. Were you a member of the Salvation Committee? No, I was against it. Why were you against it? Because I, th I felt we were not fighting a worthy cause. We were fighting to destroy ourselves. What we should have done is to approach government and, and I think in those days we would have got somewhere. We have the, the Prime, Ministers of Sen, Prime Minister of St. Vincent, Grenada, Dominica and St. Lucia, we would have got somewhere, right? But in, instead, we chose to destroy ourselves even further by destroying what we have already worked hard and produced ready for marketing, right? I think there was a lot of room for dialogue. And that never happened. They preferred to take up arms and cause all kinds of destructions. They burnt up my shed. In December 1994, a mere three months after Hurricane Debbie, another strike was called, and again. 
the action was marred by vandalism. On the East Coast, 2,800 bunches of fruit were maliciously destroyed and 16 packing sheds burned down. What about the farmers who were not participating, participating farmers in the banana salvation? Were they victimized? I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say they were victimized. If you have one banana farmer that has a thousand trees cut down, would you call that victimization? No. You, if you have a farmer who has a shed burned down, would you call that victimization? No. If you have a farmer whose road to his farm is blocked because he decides to cut, whereas the banana salvation company says you're not cutting, wouldn't you call that victimization? No. If you want to benefit from it, you have to make a sacrifice. And if I am going to make the sacrifice and you're going to reap the benefit, then you have to suffer the consequences. Strike class is difficult. bit difficult. Well, low cost strike, only for strike for your call. See if you have a dollar, la lil, only dish the la lil. You can have a strike for dish the la lil. The strike about the lil is a very difficult to buy politics. During the time of the strike, I mean, we had a lot of bad blood in the industry and people would not put the, the personal differences aside and look at the holistic picture. And that created problems for us. I personally did, did not believe that it was really a, a banana issue per se. I think it was more of a political issue than a banana issue. And, and even after all that has happened, the banana farmer is still not better off. One of the things that caused me to move away entirely from the Salvation Army Committee is when the leader said to me, he was doing something, I said, but why do you? And he told me clearly that his objective was to destroy the industry. I said, oh, but I thought you were working for the farmers, that's what you think. No, it was to destroy. And then of course, it was not only to destroy the industry, to, or to destroy the industry so that they could destroy the government and so on. Elections were due in 1997, and naturally, the future of the banana industry took center stage during the campaign. The Labour Party, in its manifesto, declared that the banana industry belonged to those whose land and labour produced bananas and promised it would restore trust and confidence in the industry by returning full control and ownership of the industry to the farmers. But was this promise of privatization a payback to the ones who fought the good fight? The privatization process did not turn out to be what Kelly wanted it to be. Because first of all, People think Kenny gave me the association and turned it into SLBC. Kenny never gave Pat Joseph nothing. Kenny was not instrumental in me getting anything as far as SLBC is concerned. Right? You may say, if you so choose, that Pat Joseph was instrumental in Kenny becoming the Prime Minister of St. Lucia. But you can never say Kenny was instrumental in Pat Joseph being the chairman of SLBC. Join us for the next episode of Untold Stories, the rise and fall of green gold, as we discuss the pros and cons of a private banana industry. I believe privatization was the best thing uh, that happened to the banana industry at the time. Um, I may have issue with some of the aspects of it, but I believe privatization was the best thing. The issue of diversification. If you go to the average farm around this area, all you find is a few banana trees, coconut trees, and maybe one or two orange and grapefruit trees. That cannot be diversification. The dreaded black sikatoka disease and its implications for the industry. When they uh, are not black, um, dry season, I product about three pa four pallets to 100 something. But now I product only four, um, 60 boxes. Yeah. How long have you been a banana farmer? Oh, about, about 20 years. Yeah. Is this the worst that you've ever seen it? Oh yes, that's the best worst I've seen. And stay tuned as the players in the banana industry finger exactly who killed St. Lucia's vital banana industry.
فول از نبا بین تو کردوان نان فول از نبا بین تو کردوان نان فول از نبا بین